Well, good morning, Riverbend Church. So glad that you were tuned in today. What a mighty name we worship. And uh, man, so good to be here with you. Listen, online today, I want you to drop a comment. Let us know what's happening with you, how we can pray with you. Our team's watching right now. If you are new today, or maybe you're scrolling across us for the first time, or you just hadn't let us know you've been with us, uh, I want to encourage you, go ahead right now and just drop a line in there and say, I'm new here. Uh, two things will happen. One, we'll pray for you. And two, I'd like to drop a small uh, Christmas gift in the mail to you. They'll follow up with you to let you know how that's going to happen. But again, Merry Christmas. Incredible day of worship. Uh, today, and I pray that at home where you are today, that you are well. And I know it's a different kind of Christmas, but God has a word today uh, for you, and it's this word you are not alone. And we're going to dive into the Christmas story in just a moment, but I want to tell you about a couple of things. One, again, next week we'll continue to be online next Sunday morning at 9 a.m. Also, Christmas Eve coming this week. Uh, we would love for your family to, to be a part of communion service with us. Now, you can do that in a couple of ways. You can grab Grab uh, supplies yourself and just tune in at 7 o'clock on Christmas Eve, December 24th, or you can swing by here outside of our main lobby here in Gainesville. Uh, you can pick up supplies for you and your family at any time this week and have those ready for Christmas to join in with us. But today we're diving back into this message, You're Not Alone, this series, You're Not Alone. And I'll be honest, uh, whenever I started kind of letting God, or God started wrestling with me on this message, I wasn't really sure exactly where we would be right now. But I think uh, uh, this Christmas, more than ever before, this is a message of hope that, that everyone needs to hear. You're not alone. And so let me start there this morning. Whatever you're going through, whatever you're feeling, whatever this year has dealt you, whatever the month has dealt you, you're not alone in it. And though we can't physically be there, you're like, Pastor, you're kind of lying because you can't be here with me. You're right. When I say you're not alone, I mean this, that the Lord is with you and there are people that are for you. You're not alone in the battle. You're, you, you have somebody that is with you. And here's what God spoke to me this morning. I'm just kind of wrestling uh, this morning with the message and going, God, I wish that we could go back to normal. And God said, we're not going back to normal. We're going forward to something better. And this is the word he gave me. He said, the same God who began a good work in you is gonna bring it to completion. That goes for his church. That goes for your family, for those you were praying for and it hadn't happened yet. God is gonna bring it to completion. And so that's where we hang on to his word this morning. But here's the message. You're not alone. The message of hope that Jesus spoke to us when he wrapped himself in flesh and he came Born not as a king, at least from the world's perspective, but born as a baby in a little town called Bethlehem. Why did he come? To redeem his people. To say, you're not alone. Here's what Isaiah said. Mary and Joseph, Jesus' parents, heard this repeated to them. But this was the message written about him 400 years earlier, Luke 2. Here's what it says. Look, the virgin will conceive a child. She will give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel. And we've talked about it, but the translation, this means God with us, the translation we need, because in our language, we wouldn't understand what Emmanuel is, but it means God with us. It means God's not separated from us. My people are not alone. To understand the power of this message, you know what you have to do to understand this message, Emmanuel? You have to first go back and understand the rift or the chasm that separated people from God. Mainly our sin. See, we have words we put on our sin and today because we're real sophisticated. We have words like flaws, mistakes, failures. But here's what the Bible calls it sin, and it separated us. And then Jesus said, I'm going to solve that. I'm going to redeem my people. And here's what he did. He came as Emmanuel. Can I give you the message of, of Christmas or at least a way to look at the message of Christmas for us, and this is kind of what we've used as a guide. It's this, that no one is alone in their brokenness. No one is disqualified from grace. So I don't know what you're going through, but here's what I know. Sometimes we disqualify ourselves. Sometimes we feel too broken. Sometimes we feel like our marriage is too broken. Our kids are too broken. We feel like it's impossible that God could come and heal my brokenness. But here's the deal. Emmanuel means that healing can come. 
your failures, your anxiety, your fear, your depression, whatever you're wrestling with. In Jesus' economy, that doesn't disqualify you from healing and from grace. It actually is a prerequisite for grace, realizing that you're broken and just owning it. But there's a caveat here. We understand this is the message of Christmas, so why does everyone not receive healing? Why does everyone not understand that grace has been poured? God's favor is shining down on them because there's a caveat. See, in order to receive healing, you have to make a choice. No one is alone in their brokenness. That's the blessed message of Christmas. No one is disqualified from grace. That's the blessed message of Christmas. But here's the caveat. Receiving healing and grace is a choice. See, Christmas is an invitation in a lot of ways, the story of a baby, we depicted it in our, in our nativity sets. But that story, it's an invitation for you. Every time you see one, every time you see lights, every time you think about holidays, it's actually an invitation to come to him and it requires a response. It's a gift that must be accepted. It's sort of like some of the Amazon packages. Now, some of you got Amazon packages and you're like us, you're going, where are they? They were said, they said it was delivered last night, hadn't been delivered yet. All right, where are you? We're online. We're trying to get information. But those are the ones that you just allow them to drop it off wherever uh, that, that they can, and you get it. But then there are certain ones that are special, and you've asked for a signature, and so they cannot leave it unless you sign for it. You know, the Christmas invitation is a lot that way. When you think about what Jesus did, and he wants to offer healing, and he wants to offer it. He already has done everything that must be done. He's paid the way to redeem us. But we have to sign for it. We have to accept it and say, okay, Jesus, I want to make you Lord and receive it. So there's different ways that you can respond to the Christmas story. That's where I want to dive in this morning for a few minutes with you. Two different groups of people, or one, one guy, a guy named King Herod. We're going to see his response, and then there's a group of wise men who came to Jesus. We're going to see his response or their response in the story. So let's pick this up. I love the story. Matthew, written down by Matthew, he's the only one that tells us this piece of the Christmas story. But here's what he says. Jesus was born in Bethlehem during, in Judea during the reign of King Herod. About that time, some wise men from the lands arrived in Jerusalem asking, where is this newborn king of the Jews? We saw his star as it rose and we have come to worship him. King Herod was deeply disturbed when he heard this and so was everyone in Jerusalem. He called a meeting of the leading priests and teachers of religious law and asked, where is this Messiah supposed to be born? In Bethlehem of Judea, they said, for this is what the prophet wrote. And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are not the least among the ruling cities of Judah. For a ruler will come for you, for, uh, from you who will be the shepherd for my people Israel. Now let me give you a little backdrop here. Set up the story on this guy, Herod. You need to understand this about him. He was a ruthless guy. Just because he's in the Bible doesn't mean he's a good guy. Now, he was a Jewish guy. He would have known the story of Messiah coming. But do you know who he was? He was so prideful and selfish that he would even kill up to seven of his own sons to protect his throne, thinking that they were going to try to overthrow him or that they may try to take the throne too early. But here's the truth. Even though he had power and authority over Judah, it was only really uh, a borrowed power. The Roman government actually just kind of looked at Herod and said, okay, Herod, you can be king as long as you don't get out of hand. We'll let you rule your people. And the crazy thing about Herod, it was said that it was uh, safer to be his pig than it was his son. He was so ruthless uh, and his illusion of control made him a murderer by many times. And you know what else? The people feared him because of his cruel mistreatment. And so you see that. Now, there's Herod. He responds in the stories we're going to see. But then there are also these wise, respectable men who show up looking for what they call the newborn king of the Jews. There's a name for these wise guys that you don't see in, in this translation, but it's magi. You may see that. That's some magi came. That's wise men. And so we're going to kind of look at them through that. Now, Herod is deeply disturbed. He's ready to go to war. And I love what it said. Not only was Herod disturbed, put yourself in the situation. Here's some wise men that are wealthy, and they come. And they come to the king, and they say, Hey, king, we know you're king, but we're coming not to worship you. We're coming to find this newborn baby king. Now, on the outside, King Herod is probably, you know, trying to play it cool like the duck, you know, floating across the water. But underneath, 
Things are going crazy. I think he's livid inside going, how dare they come to worship a new king? And it says that he was deeply disturbed. And then that little line that all Jerusalem was disturbed with him. You know why? Because they were probably thinking, what is this crazy guy going to do to us now? Who's going to die now that his, uh, he's been threatened? See, Herod was the reigning king, not only of Judea. You know what else? Herod was the reigning king of his own heart. Can I give you a lesson from the Magi, these, these wise guys that we see in the story? It's this, every heart already has a reigning king. And here's a really nice way to put it, self. Every single heart already has a reigning king. See, these guys came and they said, we're gonna worship the newborn king. And immediately in Herod, this anger rose up in him. You know why? There was already a king and he was it. And even though he knew that a Messiah, the son of God was sent to, was to come, and he knew where this Messiah would be born. Here's the problem. He liked the current king too much. Listen, do you know the reason that we don't receive healing and grace often? We go, God, th th this gospel story you talk about that I can receive healing, that I can receive the grace of God, that God would actually pay attention to me. Sometimes we don't receive it simply because we're like Herod. We already have a king of our heart and we don't want to give it up. We like the current king too much. See, we have a little Herod in our hearts oftentimes, and it's this little tyrannic, narcissistic ruler that says, I am all about me. Now, here's a little Herod test for you. Do you have a Herod in your heart? One of the tests, you can't let anyone else drive the car. You have to drive. Even if you're going the same direction, you're like, nope, I'll drive. Listen, maybe there's a little Herod in your heart. Speed limit says 55, so that means 64, right? The sign says, stand here for social distancing. You know what I mean? You're walking through and you see the little sign, stand here for social distancing. You refuse to stand on it simply because it said it. There may be a little bit of Herod hiding in your heart somewhere. You know another one? You can't receive good advice simply because it wasn't your idea. Maybe a little Herod hiding in your heart. Listen, one of the greatest obstacles that anyone has to overcome in order to receive the gift of Christmas, grace and healing, it's pride. You know why? We like being in control. We've been taught that we're the masters of our own destiny and we need to take charge of ourselves, that we need to be responsible, and we do. We need to, to take responsibility. But here's the crazy thing. Even to the point, though, that we refuse to let our creator, who knows what's best for us, be in the driver's seat, take his rightful place. You know, there's a tragedy wrapped up in this, conversation, in this story so far. Herod the leader of the Jews who was close by to Bethlehem, he's in Jerusalem only a few miles away. He missed the Savior. And then when he hears about him, he's not sure he wants to know him anyway. And then you have these wise men, and we don't know a lot about them, but they've traveled from a long ways away. Scripture, uh, scripture doesn't tell us exactly. It says from the east. Today, there's you know one, one uh, uh, scholar thinks that maybe Germany. There's actually a museum there to the wise men, but maybe from Germany is where they travel. It's a long ways from Germany, what is modern-day Germany, all the way to Jerusalem. So they took months to get there. The guy who was close by missed it, while the people who were far, far away, they sought the Lord. See, the scripture says wise men from eastern lands came this long way following a star. They saw something that piqued their interest, and they began to follow it. And so, listen to this. Here's something else they teach us. Check this out. The further we feel from Jesus, the more attractive his grace and healing become. Now think about that. Sometimes it's the people who are, who are right beside Jesus, it's the ones who are close that miss him, while those that seem so far away immediately run and fall at his grace. The wise men sought out this new king Look what it says, verse two. They said, Herod, where is the newborn king of the Jews? We saw the star, and look what this says. We have come to worship him. Not you, Herod. We've come because we want to bow down to this new king. We won't be the first, and yet the Jewish king nearby was infuriated at the thought of another baby king, even though it was the Messiah come to set the captives free. I can't help but think of what Jesus said about those who are far away from God and realize it. Sometimes the grace is most attractive. Here's what Jesus preached a little later on. He said, I came, I have come not to call those who think they are righteous. Let me explain that. Those who think, God, I've done everything right. I'm a pretty moral person. 
I've, I don't really need grace that much. I mean, yeah, I have a, I have a few f- mistakes and flaws. I got a little bit of uh, you know, things I got to work on. I got to clean up my language. You know, I don't really have anything big, though. I'm a pretty good person. And so basically, we think we're righteous, but here's what Jesus said. But I came for those who know they are sinners and need to repent. You know what it's like? It's those who are, are far from God. Now, here's the, here's the beauty. Jesus came for both the rebellious and the religious. It just seems sometimes that rebellious people recognize his grace first from the furthest away. Those that have never been affiliated with the church and they get this picture, you telling me that there's a God who loves me? You telling me there's someone that can forgive me and begin to heal me and give me new life? I'll take that. And so they run to him, but yet those that have maybe grown up around church and around religion, you kind of miss it. It's like, well, I've done some good things. I've been in church my whole life. Have you ever received the gift of Christmas? Jesus said, those who are far away, those who realize that they're messed up, those who realize they're flawed and admit it. I was talking to one of the Swedish young ladies this week in my office with her mom. She's a second grader named Eden, and and she wanted to follow Jesus uh, and be baptized. And so I was talking to her and sharing the gospel with her. Do you know where we had to start? We had to start at this place that, that everybody is broken. Everybody has sin. So as sweet and smart as she was, I'm looking at her going, she'd probably never, never done anything wrong comparatively, you know? She'd never done anything wrong. But really, when I asked her, you know what it said? I said, Eden, have you ever done anything wrong? And she goes, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And I was kind of shocked. Her eyes got big. She said, oh, yeah. And so as we were reading the scriptures, I said, well, Eden, what does that make you? And she said, a sinner. And I thought, right there, this this young lady has it. See, you cannot even come to the grace of Jesus until you're willing to admit you're broken. So many people miss God's goodness and the gift of Christmas simply because they refuse with everything in them to say, I'm too broken to fix myself. I can't do it on my own. Until you get there, you miss it. See, how many people knew nothing of Jesus, but yet you're part of Riverbend Church today? or you're a part of the family of God today simply because you were so far and you saw the grace light shining, maybe in somebody else's life, and then you heard this good news about a Savior who wanted to heal and redeem, and you said yes. Here's the beauty, though. Even for those that are close and you've been knowing about him a long time, it's never too late to say, you know what, Jesus? I don't care what anybody thinks. Even though I've been in church 15 years or I've been, a, I've been saying I'm a Christian for 10 years or all my life, but I've never truly accepted your healing in Christmas. What a great time to give a gift back to God and just go, God, I'm sorry, here I am. I admit that I still need you. So Herod consults the Bible experts in the story here. They know plainly that Jesus was be to, to be born in Bethlehem. The, the wise men, they make it to Jerusalem, but they're not exactly sure where this king is. They assume Herod would know, and actually they assumed he'd be happy because this king was meant to rule over all of his people, ultimately over all of creation. And so they assume Herod would be happy and that he would be looking for him too. Well, Herod consults the wise men, but it's really wickedness concealed by fake hospitality towards them. Look at verse 7. Herod concerts his his wild men. Herod called for a private meeting with the wise men, and he learned from them the time when the star first appeared. And we'll come back to that in a second. Then he told them, go to Bethlehem and search carefully for the child. When you find him, come back and tell me so that I can go worship him too. Now here's the thing. It says that he learned from them the time when the star appeared. They don't say here, but we know looking at the context of Scripture that it was about two years because later in the story, what you find out is Herod didn't really want to go worship. He wanted to take care of any threat to his throne. And so based on that two-year span that the wise men said, we've seen the star for two years, he goes to Bethlehem, Herod does, takes his army and kills every baby boy two years old and under. Can you imagine the little ones being ripped from their parents' arms and taken away on that night? But that's what's going on. Listen, Herod is a wicked guy, but he's trying to play it cool. Go find him, and when you find him, let me know so I can come worship him. But it was deception. And look what happened. God is with the wise men here. It says, after this interview, the wise men went their way. And all of a sudden, so now they've consulted the word. The word says it's going to be in Bethlehem, and all of a sudden the way becomes clear. This star they had seen in the east, it's almost like now it comes down and it begins to guide them directly to Bethlehem. 
So they make this couple mile journey over to Bethlehem. It went ahead of them and it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were filled with joy. So they entered the house. They saw the child with his mother, Mary, and they bowed down and worshiped him. And check this out. They opened their treasure chest and gave him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. When it was time to leave, they returned to their own country by another route, for God had warned them in a dream not to return to Herod. I like that last part right there, that they went another way. One of the ways to take that is not only did they go home by a different direction, they also went home uh, in, with a different heart. They went home with a new heart, maybe new life. Maybe they found what they sought in this Jesus. But they teach us something here. See, it was their circumstances as astrologers that drew them towards God. God allowed something to pique their interest. He put them in a situation where they couldn't help but seek him out. But then when they got to Bethlehem, when they got to Jerusalem, they consulted the word, and that's what actually led them to Bethlehem. See, here's what God's doing in our lives today. Same thing he did in their lives. Jesus, he draws people to himself by circumstances of the world and truth of the word. Listen, I absolutely cannot stand coronavirus. When I think about this entire year, I think about the pain of it. I think about everything we've gone through. And I'm just gonna tell you, I don't like it any. But then I think about how people have been hurt. Maybe you're watching and listening today and the circumstances though uh, of the loss or the, the job loss, the diagnosis. What has happened in you is hope is rising because now these circumstances have drawn you to your savior. As much as I don't like this virus, the circumstances God is using to work for our good. So I'd argue that anything that the enemy means for evil in our life, any circumstance the enemy wants to, to take us down with, actually, God is working it for good, like the divorce. The thing you think that has disqualified you from grace actually is what God is using to draw you. The diagnosis, the rift in your family relationships, actually God using it to draw you. And you're like, okay, God, you have my attention. And here's the thing. So many times the circumstances of our world get our attention, but we stop there. Listen, the truth of his word, Emmanuel, the good news, that is actually what gets us to him. And I love this picture of humility in verse 11 that we see. Look what it says. When they entered the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary and they bowed down and worshiped him. Then they opened their treasure chest and gave him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. When it was time to leave, they returned to their own country by another route, for God had warned them in a dream not to return to Herod. And so they saw this baby, they come in and, and they bow down and they worship him. Herod doesn't want anything to do with him. He wants to kill him, but yet wise men here at his feet, and this is crazy, but think, we don't know that when the wise men came before Herod that they bowed down and that they gave him any gifts. They just came and said, where's the newborn king? But then here we find them coming to Jesus and when they get to Jesus, what do they do? They, they bow down and they open up their treasuries and they let it go, Jesus for you. I don't even think they understood everything about Jesus. I think they knew enough just to get there too. And when they got there, they couldn't help but worship. We wanna worship this king. As they got there to his feet and they, they laid their treasure down, God just kind of spoke to me this week and said, it's, it's the same way with us. When you finally get to him, the circumstances in the word have revealed this God that loves you, this Christmas gift that sometimes we struggle to receive. And here's what the Lord spoke to my heart, that when you lay it down, you will leave different too. When you lay it down, see, not just coming to Jesus, but laying something down at Jesus' feet there's so much pride in American culture, and I know right here, you know, North Georgia especially. I grew up, right, I'm not too far, grew up not too far from here, so culture's not a lot different. South Atlanta, where I grew up, compared to North Atlanta, where we are. But here's the truth, I don't know about you, but, but it seems to be this pride, I got this. I pull my own bootstraps up, I'll handle this. Well, that gets us a long ways in life, but we come to a place where we gotta wrestle that out with God. God, I don't want to lay it down. Well, what is it, pastor? It could be my career. I know God's asking me to do something to trust it. I don't want to do that. 
It is anything that is an idol in their life. Anything, when we come and bow down before Jesus, but sometimes I think we hold on. We go, I'm not opening my treasury to you. <laughs> you can't have my kids. Lord, I'll worship you when the church is open and I can go, listen, I will go and I'll even watch online in my PJs. <laughs> but don't you expect me to open my treasury. Crazy thing is, until you open up the treasury, you can't really leave his presence different. I find that gifts interesting that they brought. They brought in gold and frankincense and myrrh. Seems kind of like weird gifts for a baby, right? You think they bring wipes and diapers and whatever. But they bring gold and one of the representations of gold, it was like the finest metal, the finest thing they could give for a king. They didn't give Herod gold. They came and bowed down before Jesus and gave him gold. And then frankincense. In other words, frankincense is like an incense. It would have been what the priest would have used to offer sacrifices. They would have understood this, the incense piece. And so to represent not only was Jesus the king, even though he was a little baby, that he would be the great high priest that would intercede before us for God once and for all. No more animal sacrifices, this little sacrifice right here. And then that goes to the third gift, which was myrrh. And myrrh would have been an, an, an ointment that would anointed a body, embalmed a body. With Jesus, it only had to embalm him for a few days when they put the spices on him because he would rise from the dead. But the myrrh stood for a savior that would die and would rise again. See, today, every single one of us draws near to Jesus through circumstances. I don't know what got your attention or why you're watching. Maybe a friend said, hey, you need to tune in today. Maybe they invited you on our campus and then they called you back and said, actually, we're not meeting today, but you need to get online because listen, the word is still going out. And you need to hear this today. Your circumstances have got you right where God wants you. And you go, okay, I'm listening. I hear what you're saying. It all goes back to whether you can receive the gift of Christmas or not. Though. You're not alone in your brokenness. You're not disqualified from grace, but you got a choice to make. Do you know what we will do to ourselves? We will lie to ourselves and tell me, not me. We will self-isolate. Many times we will self-destruct. We'll speak self-fulfilling prophecies of how we're no good and we'll never make it, how we're not good enough, how this couldn't be for me. And yet God's going, no, 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 it's you. It's you, come on. Come on, right there in your living room, right there, wherever you're watching from, on your phone, on your TV right now. Listen, it's for you. This is a live message. God's speaking to your heart, this word of hope today. And he's going, what choice will you make? Will you lay it down at my feet? so that I can make a change in your life, actually so that I can give you new life, or as Jesus said, abundant life, full and rich and satisfying life. Here's the questions this morning. What it do you need to bring to Jesus' feet? Now, if you've been here on our campus, you know there were days where literally people would get down on their knees before the Lord. And I know that's maybe a little weird for some of you, but they'd get that serious with God at, a, you know, it's kind of steps, kind of just regular old steps down here. But what would happen is they would come and feel so compelled to go, God, I got to get it right right now and just get down on these. I don't care what anybody else thinks. But Lord, I'm gonna worship you and I'm bringing something to you today to lay it down. I'm bringing my marriage down. I'm bringing my kids down. I'm bringing my financial situation. And God, I am letting it go at your feet. And I'm putting it down for you, Lord. I'm getting off the throne of my heart. I'm laying it down at your feet. All the worries and the concerns I have about my life, I'm laying it down at your feet, Jesus. Here it is. I don't want it anymore. I can't carry it anyway. It's not doing me any good. Or on the flip side, Lord, this thing that's going good in my life, this one thing I don't want to let go of. I'm not letting go, God. It's mine. What it do you need to lay down? Listen, here's the crazy thing. Why would you hold something that's less than the good thing God wants to give you? His presence, his healing, his grace, his mercy, his salvation. But the wrestling in our hearts at Christmas is will we receive the gift? Will we just look to him and go, Jesus, I surrender like you've gotten my attention all year this year. I'm frustrated. I don't like anything that's going on around me. I wish it could just go back to normal. And he's going, I don't want you to go back to normal. I want you to live new life. I want you to accept and live this new life in me, but you gotta lay it down. And then there's this other question, who's on the throne of your heart? Because when you start talking about laying it down, you gotta imagine, you know, every heart has a throne. And this is my little throne up here. 
Let's just imagine for a moment, every heart has a throne and there's somebody sitting on it on a day-to-day basis. Do you know what it looks like to receive the gift of Christmas? Is to say, God, I have been going my own way long enough and I have messed my life up royally. I've had some good days, but Lord, I'll just admit, like I can't do this anymore. I can't mom anymore. I can't dad anymore. I can't manage finances anymore. I can't make my marriage, like I can't do it anymore. I can't go back to this job on my own power. I can't handle any more isolation on my own power. I can't handle feeling alone on my own power. Here's what has to happen. Listen, our circumstances may not change, but surrender looks like this. Jesus, here it is. You sit on it. The most amazing thing happens. We find peace that we've never had before. Maybe for you, you know Christ, but it's just getting off the throne of your heart and going, God, you, you get back on there. Like you being controlled again. I'm gonna go into a new year here really soon. What a great Christmas gift. Lord, just go ahead and give you my life now. re my life to you now so I can say, you know what, 2021, Lord, I don't know what it looks like in the world, but I know what it's gonna look like in my heart, surrender. So listen, church, today, have you surrendered your life to him? Here's how simple it is. Not easy because you got to wrestle it out, but it's simple. He's already given you himself at Christmas. He already gave his life for you on a cross and rose for you. And here's what he says. If you will call on the name of the Lord, you will be saved. If you believe in your heart that Jesus got up out of the grave, if you will confess it with your mouth that he is my Lord, he is my boss, you will be saved. And, And listen, the Bible even says that's foolish. It sounds crazy until you try Sounds crazy until it happens, right? Will you surrender your life to him today just by going, Jesus, I receive your gift. I give you back my life. Uh, Lord, I open up the little treasury that I do have, everything I have, Lord, I lay it down at your feet. And here's what's happening today. As you do that, he's receiving you and peace is falling on your life. Even in your house right there where you are is your heart swelling up and you're going, God, thank you. So just tell him, thank you. Listen, it's not about all the words. It's about the surrendered heart. I got off the throne of my heart. Jesus is yours. My life is yours today. I believe you. Just tell him and then just praise him. See, I don't think there's a greater way to celebrate Christmas than to celebrate a life that has been changed. Somebody who's getting off the throne of their heart and going, God, it's yours. Jesus, it's yours at Christmas. So in just a moment, we're gonna celebrate baptism, but I need to ask you a question. If today, uh, let me make a statement first. If today you have given your life to Jesus, will you just drop it in the comments right now and say, I gave my life to Jesus. I wanna talk to you. I wanna celebrate with you. But maybe you know God's been asking you to lay something down at his feet, get off the throne in an area of your life, and maybe it's baptism. You go, I need to let the world know that I follow Jesus through baptism. Listen, let, let it be known. Unashamedly put it in the comments. Today I'm following Jesus. Today I'm ready to be baptized. Call me pastor, talk to me. I wanna to talk to you about it. Listen, I'd love to talk to you about it. But here's what I wanna do as we wrap this up. I wanna pray for you. So let's pray together today. So Lord, God, I know that there are those watching today and Lord, you've already been working in their hearts and they've received the Christmas gift this morning. And Lord, there are others that are facing battles and they just needed your peace today. And so God, I pray that even though we're watching in hundreds of homes across our area, God, that that today you would speak your peace into every home and your healing. God, I know there are hearts that need mending today. And so Lord, we cry out to you. God, I ask you to let the mending come, the healing that, that passes understanding. We can't even understand where that healing comes from. Lord, our circumstances don't change, but it's like right in the middle of it, as we lay it down, as we lay ourselves down as we get off the throne of our own hearts Lord it's crazy that you speak peace and so Lord I speak that over your people today Lord will you make your face shine on us God will you sustain us through this crazy time in our nation this crazy time in our world and and what it's done to our families God will you let us rise up and be stronger Lord, will you raise up this generation will you raise up the families to be strong for the name of Jesus God, that it would be like a crazy wildfire revival that breaks out all over because of what you're doing in homes right now. So Lord, that is my prayer today. Jesus, thank you for Christmas. Thank you that you chose 
of your own accord because of your great love to not leave us alone in our brokenness. By your cross, prove that there is nothing that disqualifies us from grace. We receive it today. And everybody said, amen. Come on, worship with us. Even if you're in your living room, we're gonna worship and we're gonna have a baptism day to celebrate and go public with that. So Michael, let's worship together. Dead in my sin. Lost without hope, no place to be in. Your love made a way to let mercy come in. When death was arrested, in my life began. Last was redeemed, only beauty. Given a name, my morning grew quiet, my feet rose to dance. When death was arrested, my life began to break. For your sins, so free, washes all. It's unbelievable the power of God continues to work. And so we had baptisms lined up for today and we're trying to figure out how to do it. And I, I called Emily this week, her husband, Cody, they're here. They've been friends of ours for quite a while now. Uh, Cody's been in my small group. So I got to know this guy early in the mornings, but got to know Emily. She's, she's a lot sweeter than you are. I'll just say that, Cody, but I think everybody say that. But I had an incredible conversation with Emily and uh, you said in middle school that you gave your life to Jesus, but these years you've wrestled and finally just knew it was time to nail it down. Well, she got up the courage to do it. 
And then we weren't going to meet on campus this week. And she was like, okay. So I called her and I said, would you be willing if it was just you? And she's like, yes. And so Emily, uh, it's really cool. Just your boldness and your courage to be here today. And so I have a question I want to ask you. Have you made Jesus Christ the Lord and Savior of your life? Well, based on that profession of faith, I baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Oh